<laughs> Depending how serious these questions are. It's a bit of both, isn't it? It's serious, but not really too serious, because it's not really about us. Where do we direct attention when we observe the mind? Head, brain, thoughts? <laughs> and from where do we observe? Head, brain, body, outside the body? <laughs> so perhaps this pertains to the afternoon guided meditation, and perhaps Bhante Nito had something else in mind. But my understanding of this is that it doesn't matter where you put your mind. Um, in other words, you're not trying to observe it in a physical location. You're trying to get in touch with the quality of how you're knowing, if you like. The quality of what it is to know. Does that make sense? And if you really want to put that in a place, then I would say put that in the present moment. One of the things that Ajahn Brahm teaches really beautifully, which took me a while to get the hang of, is there's such a thing as the perception of now. And it's a kind of perception. It's a place between the past and the future. And it becomes even kind of tinier than that when we recognize it as just a single moment. So if there has to be a place, then I'd say it's a, a place in time, if you like, rather than physical location. But uh, if you do observe your body, because your body hasn't disappeared, if you are aware of your head or you find your focus is in the brain, so to speak, never mind, it's not the point. It can be there on the kind of outside of your awareness. But the main thing here is we're looking at the quality of the mind. We're observing the observer, if you like. And we're just noticing uh, what it knows. Does that make sense? It's quite a subtle meditation. I mean, in a way, you're kind of watching for how the knower likes to get involved sometimes, uh, how it might judge or react, and you're trying just to keep it very, very uh, passive uh, and non-judgmental. But it is quite subtle because uh, I don't really know if you can say there's such a thing as bare awareness as long as the hindrances have not been subdued. So it's a little bit relative, but uh, it's a chance to just relax your mind and to just allow whatever arises to arise, whether it's feelings in the body, thoughts, um, pleasure, pain, whatever it might be. Uh, the main focus here is on um, just sitting back in that place of knowing. Does that make sense? And is that kind of describe what you were after? Yeah. So. When I work with a task or a problem, I feel I must engage with a lot of energy and emotional ownership to work and solve it. Can you say something about mindfully and skillfully working with a task that is hard and taxing or daunting or like difficult, hard? So basically, and I, this is, I assume this is like this is not so much about meditation, this is like your life, and your work, and your family, and there's something you have to do, and it's difficult, and then uh, you, just to, just to fix and solve those problems, you, you put a lot of ownership and focus and work to solve it, which is, well, fair enough, <laughs> and it's a nice, a good, a good thing to do. But how to do that, um, uh, with uh, uh, skillfully, skillfully working with difficult tasks in life. I think that's the the question. Um, I th the first thing which pops up in my in my mind is that um, uh, is this ability we have to be mindful. So actually, and, and this person is actually seeing that, which is really good to see that you are actually, when you are in a situation and there's a problem, there's a task to be done, first of all, you're actually aware of your mind and you, you, you do this thing, you really engage and, you, and maybe you, you, you put like too much energy into solving it, so you get tired. Because that's the effect of if you put too much energy and thinking and worrying and concerning about the problem. So the first thing is to seeing it as you do. Then um, you can ask for help. You don't need to do it alone. 
Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, uh, that's one of the, uh, one of my big lessons I've got since we started this Buddhist society here in, in Norway. How much different it is to do something alone compared to do it in a group. When you are alone in doing something, like, like we, it's like we, we, we only see what we see in our mind. When there is a problem, when there is a task, and you kind of put your mind to it, you only see what you see, and you don't see what you don't see. And there isn't anybody who sees, there, is, there isn't anybody inside who sees what you don't see. So, so by having other people around you, they will kind of um, expand, uh, like, uh, I, uh, expand the, uh, the view of this task. And they will come with many more um, options on how to solve it. So instead of trying to kind of find the optimal solution yourself, you can ask other people. And the more diverse people you have around you, the more um, uh, uh, kind of options how to solve your problem will just pop up around you. And when when we uh, when we started our Buddhist society, we were just I was did I did most most of the work in the beginning, and then we had a chairman, and it was so valuable for me to work with just one other person. And then we became five persons, and now we're like seven or eight people in, in, the, in the committee, in the board. So when we have a problem, we just kind of lift it up. And then people, yeah, you try this, well, you, you can do this way, you can do that way. And then it's so easy to come to the best, to kind of find the best way of doing it without making it into this mental struggle of finding out how to do it in the best way. That is a really good idea, to, to ask people, to ask for help then you don't end up just burning a lot of energy trying to solve it in a good way. It's kind of logical. But if you don't have all these people to help you, uh, then maybe you can try to find them. You can be a friend. I, I don't know what exactly what this is about, but there are always people around you. It can be family members, it can be somewhere, a colleague at work or something. Um, so I think that's a really skillful way of doing it. And then I just, I just, I can't talk too much about it, but I, there's one thing you always can, okay, two, okay, two things. <laughs> there's one, one saying which is, I've been programmed by Ajahn Brahm. And I'm, I really try my very best to do that. He's, uh, he's saying that whatever you do, try to put fun and joy into that process. Deliberately, okay, now this is a task you have to do. Try to do that in a fun way. Try to have to create some joy around this thing. Like I had to my my first retreat, I had to do dishwashing for nine days. You can kind of look at it and try to create some positive things around it. So there's joy, there's happiness. That makes this task easier to do when it's fun. Okay. How do you let go of deep regret and feeling of having messed up permanently? Thank you. Oh, well, as I was saying this morning, we can't just let go because that would be a kind of bypass. So we have to actually feel how that feels, first of all, and recognize the suffering it's creating for you and then come up with some kind of way of working through it. So, first of all, and I'm sure you know this, that no feelings are permanent. Uh, it's a feeling of having messed up permanently. It's a perception, it's a thought that you've messed up permanently, but there's actually no such thing. So at least have a bit of distance from that thought and recognize it just as a painful thought. Um, because it will very much depend on your mood as to how you perceive the past. You know, when you're in a good mood, you won't feel that way. When you're in a bad mood or something goes wrong in the day, then you'll connect it to all the other things that ever went wrong in your life and you'll just think the whole thing was a mess. 
But the thing is, you always have this moment and there's a way to respond now that starts to overcome some of this um, uh, feeling of having messed up, feeling of regret. Regret is a kind of guilt, I'm figuring here, because there is such a thing as a healthy kind of regret that is just understanding we've done something that wasn't very skillful, recognizing it, acknowledging it, and kind of determining to try better next time in a, in a really good way, not like a parent or a teacher saying, do better next time, but, you know, recognizing that, okay, I did what I did at that time because I didn't know better, but now I have a chance to do something different. You know, I can live and learn. Um, but in this case, it sounds as though the deep regret has actually gone into a kind of a guilt or a kind of shame, perhaps. Uh, maybe even resentment towards yourself. And for all of those things, the remedy is usually loving kindness. Yeah. So if there is some resentment to yourself, the Buddha gives different methods to overcome that resentment. To you, to life, to what you did. And the first one is usually loving kindness. So just wishing yourself well, wishing yourself freedom from this pain and suffering, from this regret. It might be that compassion is even more skillful because metta is usually um, given in a kind of broad and general way, whereas compassion is a kind of feeling of goodwill that focuses on some freedom from suffering. So you might actually practice compassion meditation by giving yourself blessings such as, may I be free from suffering, may I let go of regret. I don't know if that's really a good one actually, because you don't want to force yourself. But may I find forgiveness perhaps, may I find forgiveness, yeah? And may I be free from suffering. So you can practice in this way and try to sometimes externalize it in the sense of, think how you'd counsel a friend. See if you can actually respond to yourself from a different perspective, from the perspective of somebody who is really forgiving, who is really compassionate, and who does understand that you're just human. You know, how would you respond to a friend? You probably wouldn't say, you know what, you've messed up your entire life. You, what you did was unforgivable. You know, is there anything really unforgivable? We can forgive people for doing the most heinous of crimes. You know, people act that way out of delusion. They're doing something that they often think is the right thing to do, but out of delusion it distorts the whole thing. So um, I would say give yourself lots of kindness and understanding and empathy and try to see yourself the way a friend would or the way that you would see a friend and uh, yeah, try to learn along the way to develop these beautiful emotions. Because just letting go without developing compassion is actually missing a lot. So see if you can develop some self-compassion. <laughs> is, is, there, is there any small thing we could do for you that, I guess that's us kind of teachers, to make your day 1% happier? <laughs> um, um, yes, there is. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I've been, um, since I came back from Australia, I've been working really hard to create uh, um, like a Buddhist society, uh, um, enable kind of teachings, creating arenas for practice like we're doing here. And why on earth am I doing that? <laughs> why should I just run into some kind of on forest place, I just stay by myself and just focus my own kind of development and enlightenment and just forget about all of you. Like, who cares? <laughs> why, why am I doing this? Um, I'm doing this because um, uh, what is um, what you can achieve, or achieve is just a wrong word. <laughs> is that the result of this training, when you really get going and you kind of learn the basics and you learn to kind of lift up your mind and you get into deeper states of meditation and just happiness and after happiness, and you start to use such a beautiful mind to develop wisdom, 
there is so endless uh, of positive things, the outcome is so endless positive. And it's so inspiring for me to see that people slowly uh, practice and they get results. And then we have like private interviews and they come, yeah, I got this going and I managed to do this, etc. That's what we're doing this. That's why that's my motivation. I just want to see you or people or members uh, progressing on this path, developing towards kind of removing slowly the suffering of mind and developing happiness and, and wisdom. And that is so inspiring for me to see. And uh, uh, again, Lajan Brahm, in his room, he has like a, what is called a board, a, a, a table of the Rosh A board, a board, yeah, a board on, the, on, on, on the wall. And he got all these letters and all these cards, like, thank you, Vivian, you helped me, you saved my life, and all these things he, um, he, uh, he does to help. And people write back, he put it up on the wall, so he see it. Because that gives him inspiration and gladness and joy, which again he uses for his own development and meditation. So I'm doing all these things. I'm working and setting up this society and trying to create something positive. Because I enjoy, I just get so happy and inspired by people getting results. So if there's one thing you could do to make me 1% happy, or us, is that just continue what you do now. Just do the best out of this retreat, honestly. Just focus on your own development, and then uh, you make me happy. And probably John as well. Yeah, I would just say, um, as a part of that practice, to practice loss of metta, because then we're receiving your metta as well. And you, of course, are developing it inside. That's the real point. <laughs> so that becomes a foundation for success in practice. Do Buddhists believe in non-physical guides? Huh. Um, I'll probably do this one quite quickly because I think we're getting a little bit um, <laughs> a little bit behind. Um, not really, and yet not absolutely not either. But we're not really um, we don't give it much importance. Like the main guide for us is the Dhamma, is the practice, is trying to align our lives with the truth, with kindness, with goodness, with virtue, and with the Eightfold Noble Path. So. There may be celestial beings who rejoice when we do good. Um, there may be even people from the Brahma Loka, not really people, but beings who had very, very deep meditation in this life and then were reborn in those planes. And it may be that sometimes they come down to, for example, encourage the Buddha to teach. This is how the stories go. Um, but I think this is fairly rare. And I think a lot of the time, if we do believe that something's trying to guide us or some other being is trying to guide us, we have to question it because it could be our imagination and not give too much importance to that. Yeah. Can meditation be a form of escape from our reality and, <laughs> and or a tool for handling our reality better? Um, uh, uh, in theory, <laughs> like one thing is what it might be, and another thing what is the teachings of the Buddha. Um, can it be escaped? In theory? But I, okay, at least I can say that that is not the intention. That, um, meditation is a tool to temporarily empower our mind so that we are, can see things more clearly and go deeper into our mind and understand the true nature of our mind to create like an ultimate form of happiness, a permanent type of happiness. Um, so, um, if meditation helps you um, solve all the problems of your life in a better way. It's not just 
it's not just kind of uh, developing wisdom in regarding how to get deeper meditation, but a clear, happy mind is also much better suited to 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 kind of fix your worldly problems, the social problems, the physical problems, because you have a bright, clear mind without much disturbances. So you just make better decisions. It's not kind of a mind full of craving and negativity and hate and tiredness and all those kind of things which makes our mind kind of low. If you can lift your mind, you just make better decisions. So, so no, but <laughs> um, it kind of helps us to handle reality in a better way. Uh, but can it be an escape? We can use anything to escape. I think it depends how we approach the practice. Like one of the things I always keep in mind that the practice is to understand. Yeah. That's the most important thing. It's not to get something. It's not even to get some kind of deep state. That is a result of wisdom. It's a result of understanding. So if we're really genuinely looking inside to try to understand what's going on and try to meet and turn towards the difficulties, then it's not. It's absolutely the opposite of an escape but if you are coming to meditation to try to avoid certain things or to try to for example sometimes people even use silence like don't talk to me i'm in serious silence i don't want to hear anybody else's problems you know and they look down and i mean i actually was in myanmar and there was a person like this and they refused to talk for like a couple of years you know even when i was very obviously very ill and um <laughs> to me that is something wrong there there's something wrong there's not a it's becoming too self-interested so i think you know meditation should always result in a feeling to serve others and a feeling like ajanito said to bring some of the benefit share some of the benefit that we have experienced with other people too you know that should show that we're on the right track you know we really want to help other people so that's much more important than the kind of experience that you have i think that what i think this is called there's a, I think there's a term mm. uh, called spiritual, spiritual bypa bypass. bypassing. Yeah, yeah. So I think I made a, a half joke about this a few weeks back. Is that the Buddha is teaching temporarily <laughs> spiritual bypassing, but only temporarily for a few hours. And then after meditation, you have this brilliant, fantastic mind. And then you can look into your world and your living and, 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 uh, and, and try to, to get good solutions and, uh, and wisdom. I know how to relax, find peace and let go of my body. It is very specific. I find it harder to do the same with my mind. Please tell about similarities and differences when it comes to finding peace with the body and with the mind. Yeah, so in my experience, we just carry on the same kind of attitudes that we had in order for the body to disappear. And those main, the main causes for the body to disappear is a lack of interest in the body, a lack of um, attachment, if you like, like... You're not going out and, and kind of uh, looking for sensations, looking for feelings in the body. You're actually allowing the mind to quieten down. So, I mean, you're not going to completely let go of your mind at this stage. I mean, that would be full enlightenment to actually uh, completely let go of your mind. But um, the mind is already pretty calm by the time the body fades away. So it should be possible then to stay with your mind and you might not see very much at first because the mind is much subtler, but just um, continue making peace, continue being kind, continue letting go of any craving for what's going to happen next. Sometimes people get excited when, the, when they're, the body's disappeared and you just have the mind in front of you. You think, oh, what's coming next? And then of course, joy might arise, pity might arise. You may start to see some lights in the mind. And it's easy for the mind to get excited and to forget the wisdom that it had developed so far and to start thinking about, oh, where's this going next? So at that point, you've actually come away from that intention. You've moved back into craving, 
back into anticipation and the mind becomes a little more coarse again. So the trick really is to try and stay still, but it's not trying to stay still. You looked at the glasses of water yesterday and I think you actually mentioned that when you try to keep it still, it actually is worse than when you don't try. So you just stay with whatever's arising right now. Don't even think about whether it's the mind, whether it's the body, whatever. You're just in the present moment and you're just uh, being kind. No expectation, just staying there for as long as your mind wishes to and eventually you come out. But I think it's just a matter of practice because you're going into new domain and you have to kind of, Ajahn Brahm calls it, getting your night vision. At first there's not that much to see, but after a while you start to see um, mental phenomena. Sometimes it can also be the breath, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more uh, as the retreat goes on, but sometimes you're seeing something that was physical, like the breath, through the mental eyes, if you like. So you're seeing it now maybe as a light, and it's not really seeing it, it's just the way the mind interprets the breath. So we just carry on staying present and keeping the mind quiet and, and soft to whatever experience arises. So don't let go of your mind straight away. Because <laughs> what will happen if you don't stay long enough, or if the mindfulness is not um, uh, brightening up, is that you'll probably fall into dullness and, and kind of slip into a sleep-like state. Um, which is also part of the course. But just make sure you're there when you wake up. Sometimes, uh, or actually quite often, when I meditate, I feel my body getting very hot. Uh, mainly, uh, the back and the torso. Any advice? Thank you so much for the teachings. So You need a polar bear. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I know. Go outside and meditate. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> Um, I, 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 I've heard these kind of reactions uh, a lot in the past. People are meditating and then the body does some kind of funny thing, which it doesn't normally do. And, uh, and uh, either it's a prickling, you have some pain here, or some prickling there, or you have some reactions somehow. And, and this guy or this girl is, is uh, getting very hot in the back, in the torso. Um, um, I know from experience that I, I have, I've also had all kind of funny things going on in my body, like like this. Um, but they, they kind of disappear by time. You have this reaction, because the reality is that um, the more calm your mind is, the more calm your body will be. And being warm is kind of the opposite of being calm. So if, if you get, the, 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 more, the, the better you get in meditation, the more your body will relax. And after a while we stop, for example, uh, being very warm or hot in, in, in your body. So I know, kind of know that it will pass by itself in the long run. But what do you do in the short run if you have this feeling? Um, uh, one, my best recommendation will uh, try to give like a signal or like a command or like a wish to your body to relax. That might help. Um, but it also, there is another option, there is another option here as well. Uh, and that, that this actually might be healing going on in your body. And there was, a, there was this example in Australia on a nine days retreat. There was this guy who had, I think it was his neck. Uh, he had all these uh, weird things happening in his neck. 
And he went to Ajahn Brahm and like, well, what's happening here? I have all these weird things going on in, in my neck. I think he had the same, the same uh, feeling of, of heat in his neck. And they had a little chat. And, they, and in the end he said that, well, he's been part of a, a car accident. So he ended up like a whiplash thing. So he, his neck got like a really smack. And their conclusion was that his body uh, was basically healing itself because now he had come to a retreat and the body has finally gotten the opportunity to really relax and calm down and then this process of the body just starts to heal itself. That might be, uh, an, uh, 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 might be the cause here as well. That the body now when you're meditating, you kind of find an opportunity to start a healing process. But outside that, um, just try to get your body to relax. Allow your body to be relaxed and comfortable. And make sure that your back is, uh, doesn't have any pain. Sit in a good way. Make sure that your body is comfortable while you're meditating. Okay. From time to time I experience some severe back pain, even though I exercise a lot. What do monks and nuns do to care for their backs when needing to sit many hours? We just sit in a way that's good for our back. We only sit this way if, if it's good for our back. We don't sit like this if it's not. So if people have a bad back, they might sit on a chair, they might lie down, they might do more walking meditation, they might do yoga, stretching, etc. The thing is, eventually we're all going to have terrible backs. We're all going to have bodies that probably can't sit cross-legged anymore. Maybe we have gastric problems like I do that mean I can't sit as long as I wish. And we're going to have to find a way to practice that doesn't in, um, depend on the body being well. So one thing to do is contemplate the nature of the body, the fact that it is subject to sickness and pain, and try to find, uh, of course, the best possible posture to relieve that pain, but also some equanimity there, and some gratitude, perhaps, for the other parts of your body that aren't in pain. You know, we always tend to like, hone in on the bits that are painful, but we forget, like I said yesterday, the palms of the hands, the sole of the feet, maybe you have very good working lungs, maybe you have no stomach, ache at all. So see if you can focus on those parts that cause a feeling of ease and relaxation and after a while you might feel that that feeling starts to spread. So that's one way and um, exercising a lot. I mean I was really ill last year, so ill that I could barely sit at all and I was on a four-month retreat so this is kind of like a crisis, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can't sit, there's nothing else to do, what on earth you do? And finally, when I gave up even trying to um, sit as long as I'd like, which meant more than about half an hour a day, um, I realised, hang on a minute, it's the mind that meditates, not the body. It's the mind. So this is where you can go to your mind and look at the quality of your mind and see that you're generating or developing wholesome states. And I also saw that I was catastrophizing. Someone used that word today. And thinking, oh, if I can't get into some deep meditation in this retreat, I can't do my next year of project work, you know, like it'll be hopeless. I depend on these retreats to really resource myself. So without the retreat, it's all going to fall apart. And then I realized, wow, that is conjuring up the future. That is just panic. Right now I'm okay, <laughs> you know. Right now I'm okay. And who knows if I can develop equanimity, if I can develop a sense of genuine acceptance and really see that I'm cultivating wholesome states, then maybe I'll be resourced. And lo and behold, I actually feel mentally very strong this year. So sometimes don't reject these things. Sometimes they can create a lot of um, skillful attitudes, strength, resilience, wisdom, and certainly compassion for, f towards the pain, and maybe the wisdom that can go beyond it as well. So, yeah. See if you can embrace even the pain as a friend that's come to teach you. 
Okay, this is a question for you for your oh, uh, talk okay. talk yesterday. I talk yesterday. Shall yeah. I do this one? Yeah, now? yeah. So okay. I think, you should. Uh, I think I gave a talk today. <laughs> ah, in the Q and A. Yeah. You spoke yesterday about exploring the numbness. How does paying more attention to numbness or pain help settling the mind and bringing us closer to jhana? Yeah, this depends really whether you want to kind of um, practice with what's arising in a skillful way or if it's possible to, you know, put the mind maybe onto the breath or onto loving kindness as a samadhi object instead. Um, I personally feel that to just go straight beyond the body and try and ignore what's arising, something is missing in one's practice. This is my personal feeling because I think it then depends very much on having conditions just so. And I think there's so much wisdom to be gained by learning to work with some of the sensations in the body as well, even if it's just for a little while, because one of the things you can see there is whether or not you're craving or reacting with aversion. And if you are, then that's a hindrance. It's not going to help you get into jhana. So deep states of meditation are never achieved through force or through kind of avoiding things we don't like. So just check your relationship to the numbness. If you find that you're not averse and that there's actually no problem and it's easy to turn the mind away, then fine, that's, that's absolutely fine. You know, you might try different things at different times. But if you are having um, uh, aversion coming up or fear about the body coming up, then I would say take the opportunity to work with that. It depends from time to time. Of course, settling the mind, again, you can't really settle the mind if there's aversion. So work with that first of all. And yeah, if you find you can let go of the numbness and pain and bring the mind into one-pointedness, or let's say allow the mind to settle peacefully with the breath, then fine, that's absolutely no problem at all. And you'll probably find if you do that, and if you do get into um, whatever level of calm that you manage to access, uh, you'll probably find the numbness has disappeared at the end of the meditation. But turn the body back on slowly. If you're coming back into your body and you're not sure whether the numbness is there or not, check it out first. Don't stand up and then fall over because you'll freak everybody out, including yourself, and the calm will disappear pretty fast. So please be careful when you emerge. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> Uh, okay, I have to hand over this question as well, because this is her uh, uh, background. You did get Guanka, didn't you? Yeah, lots. Yeah. So lots, this is a lots, question lots. about that Okay, that after type you, of... Ben. <laughs> okay, okay, I can take another yeah. one. Today, ah, this is my kind of question. <laughs> <laughs> Today I felt so happy. This is so good. And um, had uh, ex excessive energy. I immediately started to uh, plan nice activities for my loved ones, uh, whereby I found out to lose myself and my energy in the process. Um, no problem. How can I know when it's right to give uh, right. When is right to give or to keep? Yeah, okay. I, I kind of, I think I understand this question. So, somebody was doing some meditation and there were positive emotions and happiness arising. And, and it, it is true. When you're, when you're meditating and things going really well, you, 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 you have, you get this kind of mental energy. So it's so easy to try to fix all the problems, and you and 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 you do, <laughs> and you get really good. Uh, kind of, it's so easy to find um, uh, good solutions, and it's to see the right thing to do, and you, you do a lot of things which is a lot of which has kindness and compassion. So it's such a nice uh, state of mind to decide what to do, whether it's your family or your, your friends. Um, I think the Buddha called this for, um, the, the problem here is what the Buddha called for Dhamma Vichaya. 
I think that is the word. But it, what it does, it do, the thing is that yeah. if if um, um, you you can use that kind of um, mental energy to uh, solve some problems in your life, uh, but you kind of lose that energy in solving something instead of accumulating that energy and that happiness to take you into even deeper states of meditation. So when you do get a, a beautiful uh, meditation, then you, you, you basically have two options. You can use that to just continue and start meditating again. Then you have like, you have like a pole position, sitting down and you're already happy. Maybe you do another type of meditation, but you have a starting place, which is really beautiful, which can take you even more or even deeper states of meditation, which will make you even happier after that meditation. So when you get those positive, uplifting states of mind, you can take them further, or you can use them. And it's basically up to you. Sometimes it's right. If you do this meditation and you get this brilliant mind and you really want to solve something for yourself or your, or your family or your friends, that's okay. But maybe on a retreat like this, don't focus so much on all your worldly things. Try this retreat. When you have nice stages of meditation, don't waste that energy. Just, just kind of keep it inside and continue meditating and see how far you can go. Okay, that's my recommendation for a retreat. Okay, some of my friends went through the Goenka Vipassana program. From what they tell, the philosophy and practice seem very opposite of how we are approaching meditation here. Brackets, strict rules, technique over attitude, etc. Are these still complementary to each other? So... I'm not really sure about the question, the actual question on the end, but I can give some reflections on that method. Um, whether they're complementary to each other, um, I think in the end techniques tend to uh, lead us to more or less the same place. They start off very different, but actually they can merge in a way and also be used at different times in our practice. So. Hmm. That's a difficult question because there's some aspects of the Goenka technique that are not conducive to jhana samadhi. And that's mainly due to the focus on impermanence. So the focus there is on developing an understanding of how feeling leads to craving, to aversion, and learning to perceive that feeling as constantly arising and passing away, a completely impermanent, insubstantial, and developing very strong equanimity. And it has given me enormous benefits, enormous benefits, such that I could sit with any sensation, I didn't know what would arise for like six hours straight. And you can't do that through force, you do that through equanimity. Right? And the mind will be incredibly bright and very, very sharp at the end of that sitting. However, because my uh, object was actually this sense of everything dissolving incessantly, very fast at high velocity, that wasn't conducive to the kind of um, samadhi that we're developing here. So I'm going into kind of the heart of it now. That's the deeper levels of the practice. But um, from the other side of the question... Um, there is, it's true that there is a focus a little bit on, on the strictness and on a lot of sitting because it is aimed at bringing up in a way, not necessarily bringing up, but being able to develop equanimity to whatever feelings, sensations and thoughts and any mental phenomena that arise. So if we're always changing our posture, if we're always walking around having a cup of tea, then we're not going to do that. We're going to keep ourselves in our comfort zone, which is what we do our whole life. So there is that side of it. And I remember one um, phrase that Goenkashi used to say, which was, you have to fight out your own battles. And now I look back at that and I think, whoa, that is really warrior language that I wouldn't really recommend following. <laughs> and I think I probably didn't take it on quite that way. 
But uh, being younger and being kind of with a lot of time on my hands and a lot of energy for meditation, it wasn't a turn off for me. Nowadays, I'm not sure whether I'd recommend most people go to the Goenka courses, to be honest, because I think the benefits with that method come if you give a lot of time to it and sit on very long retreats. And at that point, I would say um, it does go beyond technique. It definitely does. I mean, the technique is a starting point, just as when we practice uh, breath meditation, we start off with the breath as an anchor for the mind. But eventually, most methods will take you to developing more wisdom, developing more samadhi, whether it leads into jhana or not, there, there will be more sustained awareness and more balance and serenity of mind. And also the other big important piece in practice is developing loving kindness. You know, you can do that as an attitude that helps with the wisdom practice. And I think that is probably missing from most techniques, to be honest. That emphasis on the right intention, the right way of relating to whatever arises in the mind. And uh, also the metta practice can be a way into jhana states as well. And it's one that's very... Uh, depending on your state of mind, it's very, I find, very easy because it overcomes uh, ill will and it's uh, quite easy to get into happiness and bliss fairly early on. And that can take longer for some people in breath meditation. Metta meditation can bring up those feelings of uh, ease and, and happiness and warmth and, uh, and kind of a soft state of mind fairly quickly. So um, as long as you're developing wisdom, <laughs> you're developing uh, samadhi and you're developing loving kindness, you're doing okay. I would say um, that the breath meditation, the way that was taught in the going to system was not helpful for me. It was all about trying to get to the breath and staying with the breath at any cost and trying to focus on the breath at a point. And whilst I could become very, very aware of the point, <laughs> the breath was a bit of a, a challenge because actually breath meditation is a very subtle practice. And nowadays, if I am going to practice with the body awareness or the sweeping or the equanimity, I do that at the beginning. I do that just to overcome some of the coarser hindrances and then I allow my mind, when it's ready, when it has some metta, when it has overcome coarser hindrances, I allow the mind to naturally... Um, um, invite in or notice the breath. So I kind of turn it around now. But uh, in that way, yes, it's sort of complementary, but it doesn't really take you, in my experience, some people I did experience deep jhanas through that practice, I don't know how, but if you've got to the point in that practice where everything's just constantly dissolving, constantly changing, then it's not really going to take you there. And I think there's a really great talk by Arjun Brahman, an early rains talk, where he actually says this. He says that, you know, the perception of impermanence takes you so far, possibly to limiters, but beyond that, it doesn't really hold. However, the perception of non-self can take you all the way. Because the perception of non-self means you're standing back. And you can still remain with that stability of mind. So, anyway. Does that make sense? There's a lot I could have said, but I hope that's not confusing. Yeah, I would say, like for anybody um, who started off on this path and is enjoying some benefits of this practice, whatever method you do, please don't forget the right attitude, the right way of relating, the kindness, the gentleness, and um, yeah, the going to system might be a little bit too forceful in many ways. Yeah. Okay. Um, we. We will not be able to answer all the questions tonight, so you could do one more, and then we will answer the rest of the questions tomorrow. Can you talk about the different Piti Sukhas arising in meditation? Yes, I will tomorrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one hour. <laughs> okay? One more? One more. <laughs> oh, it's two. Oh, maybe that one's good. Uh, um, I'm usually a better learner from teachers who are playful, curious and funny, but they are not necessarily happy, even if they enjoy teaching. Oh, isn't that okay as well? That's interesting, being playful, curious and funny ought to make you happy, didn't it? 
I don't know, for me, when I'm kind of happy, I get funny and curious and playful. I don't know if it works the other way around. I'd have thought it would. Um, if they're not necessarily happy, I mean, look, none of us are happy all the time, right? Unless we're enlightened. <laughs> so, I mean, I do think we can be a bit judgmental about who we think is happy and who's not. One time I was on one of these strict going courses, which I thoroughly enjoyed, and I didn't feel it was strict at all. And I was completely peaceful and really flowing with the practice, keeping my eyes down, walking, economous, balanced, profound, all of it. You know, it was just wonderful. And at the end of the retreat, after 30 days, this woman came up to me. She said, you were so angry. <laughs> and I was like, I was peaceful. <laughs> So, you know, we never really know if a person's happy. I think more than looking for whether they're happy or not, look for whether they're virtuous. Look for their conduct. You know, do they break their sealer? Are they still confused? You know, do they have at least some right view that you can check against the texts? Do they have at least some trust in the Buddha's teaching or some respect for the Buddha's teachings, even if they haven't taken it all on yet? Um, because there are a lot of kind of self-professed teachers these days and, um, you know, some of them might be very skilled in teaching, but is their teaching actually leading to results? Is it making them a better person? That's what I look for. When I met my teacher, Ajahn Brown, the things that impressed me the most straight away were the depth of the Dhamma that he taught and also, which I could feel and tell was from experience, and also the fact that he was serving like anything. He was really giving all his energy with incredible generosity to beings all over the world. And that really blew me away, that somebody can have such profound insight and depth of meditation. And they also serve. They're not only focused on their own liberation, but they're also, um, it's led to compassion. It's led to this sense of uh, deep care, deep concern, deep compassion for all beings. So that is what I would look for. Um, of course, somebody ought to be a little bit happy, uh, a little bit light and free if the path is working. But uh, I think more important than that is uh, how do they live their lives? Are they less selfish than you are? Do they keep better virtue? If their virtue isn't even up to your standard, and I'm sure your standard's good, but it should be better. You know, it should be better. That's, that's a good sign. So, um, have a nice evening and morning meditation place once to 6, 6.15 and then talk 8.30. Oh look, somebody just said, what is time? <laughs> <laughs> I guess that answers that question. Maybe, or maybe you want to do it again tomorrow. It's conventional. But it's important here. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good night, everybody. <laughs>